Hello guys, this is Panasmice36 and today's video is going to be episode 3 in the stand-up weather procedure video series I'm doing for you guys here on YouTube. In case you're new to these videos, these are full hour-long tutorials where I go through each step in my weathering process as well as the painting process beforehand. And I do a full step-by-step -step explaining how I do each effect, showing how I'm doing it, showing the products that I'm using to do it, and also explaining why I'm doing certain products and certain techniques to get the, uh, the weather result I have in the end on the finished tank as you can see here. This video features this little Panzer 1 here from Dragon. It was a great little kit. And as you can see, I've done it up in the DAC camouflage, the desert camo. Heavily chipped, as you can see in photos, especially these little Panzer 1s they're used for recon. It's a really nice finish. It provides some really interesting weathering uh, opportunities. And it's really the first time I've done uh, a desertized tank. So with the desert camo, it's heavily chipped, and the sand weathering on the lower hull. But it was definitely a learning process for me. But I definitely picked up a whole bunch of new weathering techniques and experience for another Panzer III that I'm going to do in the similar camouflage later on this year. So as I was saying, this is a full step-by-step -step weathering process. So in the video here, we're going to look at everything I did to finish up this tank, from the bare plastic to how it is here. We're going to start off by looking at how I painted on the base gray. Then we're going to cover some varnishes that we're going to apply, and then putting on the decals. Then we'll do some basic weathering, including chipping and also detail painting of the tools on the Panzer Grey finish, which we will expose later on through the desert camo. Then I apply the desert camouflage here, and then we chipped it using the hairspray chipping process, and this will all be covered in the video. Then I use some oil paints to do a little bit more weathering on the desert camouflage here, including a pin wash, as well as some streaking and other oil effects. We also cover the exhausts and other small detail paintings to finish up the tank. And finally, I did my first attempt at some sand weathering on the lower hull, which I think came out very, very good, so we'll look at that too. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please post them in below. I always read through them all. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoy the video. So, let's begin our weathering process. Here is the tank as it is completed. As you can see, it's just bare plastic right now with some photo etch on there and some clear parts. It's a very, very good kit. Um, but we gotta, of course, start by painting it. There's also some resin weld seams on the back there, so you can see the black lines. Uh, I decided not to actually prime the model because I didn't really feel like I needed to, so I went straight to base painting. We're gonna use these Tamiya paints here, as well as lacquer thinner, to get our Panzer Grey finish. First, we're gonna use XF63 to just do an overall Panzer Grey, and then we're gonna add some of the white and some of the blue to that to make a little bit of like a highlight color on the upper areas. And like I was saying, we're gonna use lacquer thinner to thin these down. I find this helps make them spray better than normal other types of acrylic uh, thinners, like alcohol-based thinners. As with Tamiya paints, always make sure you mix with the paint very well because they can kind of settle down a little bit. And as you can see, I'm using my Shish Kebab stick here as a pouring guide to make sure I don't make a big mess pouring. This helps me be accurate, not spill everywhere, and also be very precise in how many drops of paint I'm applying. As usual, uh, my mixture here, usually I put in a little bit of thinner first, then apply the paint, and then more thinner afterwards, so I don't gum up the bottom of the airbrush with just like raw paint. My ratio is probably about 60% paint to 40% thinner. Here I'm testing the consistency to see how it flows down the side of the paint cup. That's a good way to judge, though mainly you need some experience to be able to tell that. So as you can see, I'm just painting this on. I'm using my Badger Wonified Patriot airbrush, which is a nice basic airbrush. And um, as you can see, I'm applying it not in a really heavy single coat. I'm going over maybe two or three times in a moderate thickness. This is the base painting. It doesn't have to be too perfect, and uh, but you kind of want to be a smooth layer. So I'm not blasting it on. I'm applying it gently, building it up in a couple layers to make sure I don't flood the surface and ruin any details. I usually spray it about 20 PSI or so. I don't really fiddle with that too much. I mainly just fiddle with thinner ratios. Like I was saying before, I didn't actually prime anything. I just sprayed this paint right over top of the photo etch on these exhausts here and everywhere else. Didn't really matter because lacquer thinner is pretty strong and it'll make the paint dry pretty hard. So here's our finished Panzer Grey Panzer 1. The color is a little bit too dark for my taste, so we're going to lighten it up a little bit. So for my kind of highlight second color, 
I'm doing about a, a let's say a mix of about 50% of the XF63 German Grey, which is what I was doing before. And then I add about 25% XF2 flat white, and also about 25% XF18, I think it's medium blue. So I apply both these colors to the, the gray. And keep in mind that since the gray is almost black already, adding about 25% of each of these doesn't have as much of an effect as if you were adding it to look white or something like that. Darker colors need a lot of paint to actually have much of an effect when you're mixing them. So, And once again, about 60% thinner in there. So basically, adding both those amounts of paint has slightly lightened and slightly blued the color of Panzer Grey, which you can definitely see here. And I basically, uh, I didn't really color modulate this. I didn't need to because this is mostly going to be hidden under the desert camouflage we apply later. So I'm basically just painting the whole thing over again with this because I like this color more. But there were some key areas where I didn't. Mainly uh, kind of those angles under the front of the turret, sides of the hull, maybe the front of the hull and the back of the hull. Didn't really need to cover that area and it kind of uh, if you leave the dark color there, you know, it's almost like a shadowy effect. This is more important if you're doing just gray though. Like I was saying before, my, my finished tank with the sand camo doesn't really show color modulation because most of the gray is hidden anyways. I also see I'm applying it to the wheels here. The inside of the wheels, not the rubber areas, that doesn't really matter. We're just going to leave that with the black for now or the, or the dark gray. And once again, we're spraying in thin coats so you can see here. So now here's our tank in the final Panzer Grey finish. I find that, in my taste a little bit, I like my Panzer Grey to be a little bit lighter and a little more blue than it probably was in real life, but it just looked better to my eye. You can pick whatever color you want when you're painting your tank. Now I painted the model with a gloss varnish to prepare for the decals, and also to protect the base color and prepare for the chipping later. So I'm using X22 Clear by Tamiya, thinned with X28 Thinner. I thinned it a little bit more than usual, so maybe 70-80% thinner, and I apply it in thin coats, just a basic mix, just the X22 clear with the thinner in there, making sure I'm spraying nicely, and I'm just applying an overall coat of gloss to the model, which lots of people were asking me about. Lots of people in the previous videos were asking me why I wasn't using varnishes and stuff like that. You don't really need to, but you can, so I'm going to show in this video here, so you guys can definitely learn. It's definitely, it's not really a bad idea. It's a good way to just protect, protect your model if you're not sure if weathering products might mess it up later. So it's a good like backup step. As you can see here, we have a nice sheen in our model. Looks pretty good and ready for our decals. So to handle the decals, I'm taking them here with my little pliers and sticking them in a little bit of warm water. And they stay in there for about 90 seconds, let's say. A minute and a half or so. And then I poke at them with a brush and see if they move around on the paper. And if they do, that means they are ready. So I take my little pliers, drag them out of there. And then I kind of am kind of primitive and use my hands for this. Probably shouldn't, but they're Tammy decals. They're, they're pretty strong. So I the, the decal wasn't in the right spot, so I grab a little bit of water and wet it again, which helps almost make it float up off the surface and makes it easier to slide around a little bit. Otherwise, it kind of sticks on pretty well, but if you get a little bit more water on there, it'll float around a little easier and you can straighten it up. Now I'm using my brush to soak the water back out of it because I, it's in the right spot now, so I want it to dry nice and flat. And then I also apply a little bit of Microsol to the decal as well, which helps to soften it and make it stick on the surface better. So I just I get a little bit of my brush and then just gently apply it on top. Now, I removed the water before because the water was kind of trapped underneath it. This is just being applied on top. And don't apply too much, just a little bit. As you can see, it starts to get a little bit wrinkly, which can scare people, but don't worry. It's supposed to be like that. It'll dry nice and flat. And now I'm putting on some more decals here. This is the one that I'm hoping you two won't demonetize me for. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, you can see that I use my hands there a little bit. I'm just more comfortable with that. You can use a brush too, but once again here, I'm applying a little more water which helps to move it around a little bit. Straighten up the uh, Deutsche Afrik core special little symbol there, let's call it. Then I remove the water when it's nice and straight. And then we apply some microcell on top, 
just a little bit there and kind of push it down make sure it's sitting nicely on there and here's our model with the decals applied they are a mix of Tamiya and Dragon decals from many different kits I was trying to get some certain markings for this Panzer 1 for the 21st Panzer Division usually I've been trying to use masks now especially the ones by DN models they're very very good mainly because it's easier no gloss coats before and you just paint them on and because you don't have little issues like what I had with the cross on this side where it kind of got wrinkly and there was a bit of paint coming off that's kind of crappy but we covered it up later with some weathering so it came out good in the end and I'm just kind of hoping that I kind of showed you guys how to use decals in this video if you're a beginner next we're gonna move on to some basic weathering of the Panzer Grey finish so for some shipping effects we're gonna use the Panzer Grey that we use the main color the German Grey and we're gonna add a little bit of white to it to lighten it up and then we're also gonna use this model color German camouflage black brown as the uh, the like the second color in the chipping to get a little bit of a primer look. So to mix up our gray chipping color, our, our main chipping color, we're basically just going to make a lighter color of the base color. So a lighter gray than what we already have on there. And, and I'm mixing up about a 50-50 mix of the German gray uh, XF63 and flat white XF2. As you can see I'm just testing here, I apply a little bit of water to thin this down. And applying it with my very very small 10 over 0 brush which I find is good size for doing chipping effects here so the lighter color we're using here is meant to uh, kind of make almost like a highlighted edge for the chips and then later we're gonna go in in some of the larger ones and apply some of the red primer color I showed before to make it look like the paint's been scratched down to the red primer underneath You note that I am actually keeping the chips mainly around the edges of panels and even more mainly around the edges of hatches because the chips are mostly caused by the crew walking around and doing stuff and the, the main areas where the crew are accessing are the hatches of the vehicle as well as maybe the engine deck because they're servicing it there as well. So keep uh, just think if you're on the tank where, where would you walk up the tank? And where would you be touching the tank? So you'd be obviously opening up the hatches here. So lots of chipping around the edge of the hatches. And you also see the way I applied the chipping on the front of the hull, as well as with the desert camelator, was mainly simulating and emphasizing where the crew would walk around. Over here, I'm doing a little bit of chipping on the edges of the turret here, because it's almost like a little bend in the metal. Doing stuff like that is also a good way to highlight all the interesting angles and details of your tank. So maybe hinges and everything like that. You can do a little bit of highlighting on that with a chip and it looks pretty good. Now for the primer color, I'm using German camouflage black brown by model color. I think it's a very, very good color to simulate the red primer chips because it's not too red. It's a little bit brownish, so it's not too kind of stark and doesn't stand out too much. But if you look at it, it still looks a little bit red. So these colors are very, very thick. So I thin them with a little bit of water, as you can see there. And then I apply little, even little smaller chips than I was doing before inside some of the larger chips I've already done with the lighter gray. Now don't do it on every single chip. Maybe do it on a half of them or a quarter of them and keep it mainly around the largest ones. If you do the red chipping on every single chip you've already done, it'll look kind of crazy and look way overdone. The gray chips are kind of faint, so they blend in much better. So keep most of the chipping, just the gray scratches and scuffs. You note that sometimes I use my finger to just wipe away a little bit of chipping if it's too much. Because the German model color, black, brown by uh, model color here, dries kind of slower than the Tamiya paints I was using before. Like I was saying before, I'm chipping mainly around the edges and kind of like bends in the metal, welds like this, just details that kind of stick up, they're probably going to get scraped up more than the flat panels of the tank. Those you can see there's some chipping there as well. So here is our model completed with the chipping effects. 
Now I do admit that it is quite heavy, heavier than you probably want to do. However, there's a reason why I did this. It's because there's going to be a desert camouflage on top of this, and not a lot of the gray is going to be visible. So I wanted to be certain that wherever I expose the gray, a little bit of the chipping will be visible. So I basically chipped the entire thing. And in the end, some of the chipping actually was visible through the desert camo, so that's all good. Um, but mainly if you're just weathering a tank that's only gray, you can still do this. Just I would recommend doing less chipping than I did here because it looks a little bit crazy and unrealistic. But of course, you can do however much chipping you want to do on your own tank. It's not my decision how you chip your tank. Now let's move on to painting the tools and the details on the tank. Here's all the colors we're going to be using to paint all the tools in the tank. Panzer 1 doesn't have very many tools, so we can kind of keep it simple here. To begin, we're going to use Tammy XF9 Hull Red, Model Color German Camouflage Black Brown, and AK717 Rot Brown to the grips of the wire cutters. Now the grips of the wire cutters are mainly compressed paper, except for the end knobs here, which are Bakelite, which is a plasticky material, an early plastic. So I paint the ends here with the with the model color German camouflage black brown because they're kind of like a dark brownish gray color So the rest of the grips themselves are actually compressed paper that was dyed red which is a similar color But it's more red so I base paint them with the XF9 hull red by Tamiya Which as you can see is a little more orangey and has definitely a different color than the one I was using before And then on top of this I apply a kind of thin stipply coat of the AK717 Rot Brown, which is an even thinner and lighter color. So I'm just applying it gently uh, as almost like a filter, but I also staple it as you can see. And that gives me almost like a little bit of a texture, which if you look at surviving examples to this day, it definitely look like this. If you're curious about what one of these looks like, Adam Mann has a great video where he shows his original pair of wire cutters that are exactly like these. Next up, we're going to paint the wooden areas of the tools using Pan's Race 310 Old Wood and a little bit of Tamiya Japan Ground Self-Defense Force Brown XF72. So I mainly use the Pan's Race 310 Old Wood, thinned with a little bit of water because it's quite thick, as the base color for the wooden areas of the tools. So for the, us, that's the shovel here, as well as the axe underneath it. If your tank is like a sledgehammer, that's also wooden and other tools like that. And I just do an overall base coat using this color. It's very, very good. It looks a lot like the light blondish wood that the German tools are, the wooden areas at least, are made out of. And then I use the Japan Ground Sound Defense Force Brown by Tamiya. As you can see, I'm wiping most of it off, so I'm dry brushing this on. I'm just gently kind of stippling and rubbing the, the shovel a little bit. And this is mainly an attempt to get something that looks kind of like a wood grain, or at least more than one color on there. And you can see... It, it kind of does its job. I'm still not very good at the, the wooden tool colors, so I'm getting there, but this looks pretty all right for me. Next up, I mixed about a 50-50 mix of XF2 flat white and XF63 German gray by Tamiya, uh, which is basically the same color we used before for the chipping, the lighter gray chipping effect on the tank. I basically made the same color again, and I'm applying it as the metal color for the tools. So this is the head of the the shovel, the axe, and also I did a little bit of uh, kind of like dry brushing, chipping effects on the jack and other stuff after. To get a little bit of a worn effect, I mixed up darker versions of that using just more and more gray and kind of did a little bit of scraping motion with my brush and that got a little bit of a, a worn effect on the shovel there. These are galvanized steel so they just kind of get gray and scruffy when they're used. On the crowbar over here, I didn't actually paint the entire thing with the lighter gray. I just kind of, as you can see here, did almost like a chipping effect. And a similar thing on the jack here, because I didn't want to paint them the entire metal color. That'd be kind of weird. I just wanted to make them look a little bit used and weathered. So a little bit of dry brushing looks pretty good on them. I also painted the end of the wire cutters with the same color. And now here's our tank with all the tools and other details painted up. Looks pretty good. And honestly, with the chipping we've already done on there, the decals put on, everything like that, it, maybe just give this thing a pin wash and it would look pretty good. But I plan to go further with this, obviously, and turn it into a DAC tank. So we got to do more weathering to get that sand camo and everything on there. But if you're painting up a tank that's just gray, 
I'm sure this video so far has been a good reference for you. You can just do this effect here, and then, and then apply an oil pin wash that we'll cover later on the video, and paint up, you know, the exhaust like we're also going to cover later in the video, and you should be pretty good. Someday I'll do another video like this, full hour long video, where we'll cover just a Panzer Grey tank. But for now, let's move on to painting the sand camo on the tank. To get the chipped sand color on the tank, we're going to use some hairspray chipping effects. For this, we're going to need some Tamiya paint. I'm using X28 thinner here, not lacquer thinner because then it won't chip well. And XF59 Desert Yellow by Tamiya. As of before, I'm using my Badger 105 Patriot airbrush, which is a very nice, trusty, I guess, intermediate level airbrush, we could say. And then to actually get the hairspray chipping, we need, of course, some hairspray. So I'm using Tresemme Extra Fine Mist Firm Control, which is what Michael Rinaldi uses, so it'll work for me because it works for him. I also masked off some of the areas that I wanted to be left gray, so I mean this was areas underneath where the hatches that are I've posed open, if they were closed, where it would mask off the gray. And also as you can see where the markings are as well. And, and I'm just using normal painter's masking tape here, you don't have to be too fancy. This is pretty ghetto, but it, it looks pretty good in the end. As you can see we got lots of tape on the tank here, because often these markings were left exposed with the gray around them, so it looks pretty cool. So I shake out my hairspray here, and I apply two thin coats to the model. I cannot stress thin coats enough. You don't want to flood it, because then your chipping effects are going to look weird with really large chips. If you want your chips to be very, very fine, apply a th one coat, which would be a couple passes, you know, on each side of the tank. Let it dry for five minutes, then repeat that, and then you have two thin coats. So then I mix up my color here for the sand color, which is just X59 Desert Yellow by Tamiya. Looks very good for the RAL 8000 initial color they used. And as with before, I'm thinning it about 60-70% with X28 thinner. If your paint's at a good consistency, it should flow nicely like that down the side of the cup. As you can see, once again, I'm applying thin coats to the model. This is even more important than the thin coats before. When I was putting the initial gray on there, I was just saying thin coats because it wants to be nice and smooth. With the uh, hairspray chipping effects, you don't want to apply a very thick layer, otherwise it won't chip very well. So I'm just kind of applying it a couple thin coats, you can see just kind of layering it on. Being careful, I think I've got my airbrush at about 15 psi, a little bit lower now. And just applying an overall thin coat to the model, painting over basically everything because we're going to chip it off later. Just imagine you were painting this at a coastal town in Italy or something like that ready to go to Africa, you just kind of spray the whole thing, you don't really care. And here's our tank with the entire coat of yellow on it. Looks a little bit scary because we've covered up all the weathering we did before, but with the hairspray on there, we should be able to chip it nicely and expose all that weathering we've done previously. For the chipping itself, I'm using a couple of brushes here. I have a very, very soft, large flat brush at the bottom, a 10 over 0, and a 1 8 inch angular shader, and also a cup of water, which is very important because the water is what actually makes the paint chip. So take a little bit of water on your brush, wipe most of it off, and then start to gently brush at the edges of the tank. Like I was saying before, keep the chipping around the edges of the tank because those areas get worn down most. And just gently poke at it. You can use whatever type of brush you want. You can use a smaller brush here for more accurate chipping around the edges of hatches. And then obviously a larger brush is a little bit easier for kind of edges on the, the hull where you don't have to be as accurate. Here's where chipping works um, by the water soaks through the top layer of paint and then encounters the hairspray. And since you can wash hairspray out of your hair, it dissolves with water. So the water soaks through the top layer of paint, dissolves the hairspray, which then exposes the underlying layer of gray paint here. So that's how you get the nice chipping effects. And it's really as easy as it looks. You just take your brush with, with a little bit of water and just gently rub at the model. You can do scraping motions, poking motions, anything like that, and you'll find you can get different effects going. You should probably practice this technique a few times first on a model you don't care about, so you can kind of get a feel for it. 
I find the this brush here, the 1 8 inch angular shader, is the best one. Here again, I'm using my 1 8 inch angular shader. It's a nice, short, stiff brush, so it's very good at accurate chipping effects. But it's a little bit larger than a, a round pointed brush, so you can definitely get kind of like a larger, or I guess a quicker chipping effect. If you look at photos of the tanks of Southern Africa, you can definitely see varying amounts of chipping on them. You can probably go a little farther if you want to. Um, that is realistic, I guess you could say. But I, I went a little heavy here, but this is a Panzer I. It would have been there for a while. These are one of the first tanks that came over. These Panzer Ones are the 21st Panzer Division. So I'm having some fun really scraping it up. Now, as with before, keep your chipping around areas where it makes sense. You can see them chipping edges of the hatches, areas where the tank crew walks up. Lower hull here probably gets kicked up with a lot of sand and almost like sandblasted. But if you look at areas at the front panel where the driver's vision port is and stuff like that, nobody really walks there, so I didn't do very much chipping in that area. Of course, the wheels definitely get striked up a little bit because they run against the tracks, so chip them up pretty heavily. On the whole front, the crew walks up. I would assume on the side of the drivers, in front of his viewport there, not in front of the machine guns, so I chip that area up nicely. And also, the areas around the tow hooks of the front here, and the transmission cover. And of course, we also chipped up the tools because they're used pretty frequently. And we also want to show off those nice scraping wear effects I put on them earlier, as well as the wood grain. So I definitely made sure I chipped them up nicely to show off that previous weathering effect. I'm sure somebody will point out that my fire extinguisher here is left panzer gray. Fire extinguishers were never painted red. They were always left the base color of the tank. And here is our model with the completed hairspray chipping effects and the chip desert camouflage. And as you can see, I think it looks pretty cool. Like I was saying before, keep the chips in areas where it makes sense. The sides here doesn't really make much sense to have too much chipping. But areas like over here where the hatches are and the crew walks around to get up on top of the turret as well, we see lots of use. The shovels over here and the fenders are walked along a lot, as well as the front of the hull. You can see definitely I made sure I chipped off the tools here to make all the work there visible. The frontier transmission cover in the front of the tank definitely gets kind of sandblasted and worn up. The engine deck, I chipped it up heavily because the crew surfaces there a lot, and also it's probably kind of hot and might bake off the paint. And scrapes on the turret side emphasize the commander using that way to get up into the turret hatch. Overall, hairspray chipping is an excellent way to get very, very fine chipping effects in your tank. It's also pretty easy and pretty quick, so long as you practice a little bit first, get a little bit of a knack for it, and choose a lot of patience, a little bit of water, a couple of brushes, and you should be fine. So at this point, we're going to give our model another coat of gloss varnish, and apply more decals, exactly the same way we did previously on the Panzer Great. So I'm just applying Thin Down XF... Uh, X22, sorry, clear, which is a gloss paint, thinned about 70-80% with X28 thinner by Tamiya. This helps to, first of all, prepare for the decals and also helps to lock in our hairspray chipping effects because we don't want to accidentally chip it off more with thinners later, especially the water we'll be using to apply the decals. As of before, we put our decals in a little bit of warm water for about 90 seconds or so test them to see if they're moving on the paper, which is a good sign that they're ready to go. And we take them off. Once again, I'm using my hands, probably shouldn't. And apply them or transfer them to the surface of the tank. Using a knife here to just help kind of move them around. These are dragon decals. They work a lot better than the Tamiya ones I was using before. Now I'm removing the water that's on the surface there to make sure they sit nice and flat and flush. And then we take a little bit of Microsol and gently apply it over the top of the decals to make them get softened up a little bit and stick better to the surface of the model where there's chipping and bolts and stuff like that. And exactly the same thing with the cross in the rear here. I applied the second layer of markings here to add a little bit of interest on these Panzer 1s here. I was basing this off a reference photo of Panzer 1 I was fay, same thing, but it was number 125. 
It had the exposed crosses on the sides, but they painted a new cross in the rear of the turret so it looked pretty cool. Here we are applying some more microsalt to the surface there to make that decal sit nice and flush. Looks pretty good. Of course, we just applied these fresh decals over top of a nicely worn desert camouflage, so I want to chip them up and expose the gray. So what better way to do that than to hack at them with a hobby knife, I guess. I did this when decals were still a little bit wet too, not so that they would move, but so they were a little bit soft still. So I'm just kind of hacking at them, very, not really, I'm gently scraping at them. And I actually use a little bit of alcohol, like an X28 thinner in a couple of spots here, I just applied a gentle amount, which helped to soften them a little bit more, almost leach the paint a little bit, make them appear kind of blended in. And then we just gently got some scraping effects here. And that helps to expose the yellow as well as expose the gray, which helps to match the chipping on edges we've already achieved there. As you can see, we got the nice scrapes there, which kind of transition from the decals through to the actual gray underneath, which helps make the decals look like they actually are part of the model and painted on and not something we've just stuck on afterwards. It's a great way to add some realism to your tank. So at this point we've completed the painting steps, and now we can begin the proper weathering. And we'll start with an oil pin wash to accentuate some details. To make an oil pin wash, we're going to use Wilder's medium brown oil paint, Wilder's thinner, and then the same tin of reserve brush I'm using all along, as well as a little plastic cup. The Wilder oil paints are very, very good. They dry very, very quick and very, very matte. They're really good for modeling. As you can see, sometimes a little bit of oily stuff comes out at first, so gently squeeze that out in paper towel. It's very, very thin stuff. And then after that, you can get the actual paint you want coming out. It's pretty easy. A lot easier than having to soak the oils on cardboard for five hours like you do with normal artist oil paints. And here I'm applying Wilder's thinner to it. For a pin wash like this, probably is about 90-80% thinner, something like that. And you sh it should flow very, very nice as you can see here. So I'm applying this over top of the model. The model already had a gloss coat applied before the decals. I didn't apply another gloss coat to protect the decals because they should be fine. They're dragon decals, they're pretty good. And I'm just gently applying the oil paint around all the little details on the tank to make them stand out. So mainly that's panel edges, rivets, and weld seams. If your oil paint is sufficiently thin, it should flow very, very nicely. As you can see, it should just kind of shoot along weld seams and naturally settle around the entirety of a rivet once you just touch it to it. If it's not doing that, apply more thinner. It's important that you only apply a little bit of oil paint at once, or at least have a little bit on your brush at once. So take it here, test it to see if it's good, and then gently just kind of press my brush against paper towel, soaking up most of the oil paint. And I can gently just kind of touch it to some rivets here. As you can see, it naturally flows around them. Looks really, really good. Though this was a little bit excessive right there, so we can clean that up easily. So I take a little bit of the same thinner we use the thin oil paint to get the actual wash in the first place. Brush off most of it so the brush is only slightly damp. And I can gently kind of just rub away at the oil paint. This is 30 seconds after I applied it. It helps to control the amount and it tones it down a little bit. So an oil pin wash is what I'm doing here. It's when you apply it only to the details. You can also do an overall wash or whatever they call it where you kind of apply it over everything and then clean up the rest later leaving it only around the details. Uh, I prefer doing the pin wash like this, much quicker, much cleaner I guess, much more accurate, it's just kind of my style, but you can do whatever you want. The point of the oil pin wash is mainly to represent fake shadows, making the details stand up more, and overall that kind of makes the tank look a little bit larger than it actually is. Kind of the same kind of ideas, color modulation, stuff like that. Adds kind of shadows and highlights and makes the tank look a little more large than it actually is. As 
mainly if your tank has a really nice well seam texture or nice rivets on it. This also really helps to emphasize those parts of the tank. The next step in the wetting process was to just work with some more oils, not pin wash, but more just blending. So we're going to use the same color, medium brown, and also add brown shadow, which is darker, and light buff, which is a nice yellow highlight. And we're going to use the same thinner as before, Wilder's Special Thinner. For brushes, I'm using the same, 10 over 0 as always, it's a very nice brush, I prefer them a lot. And also this one here, which is number 6 flat, for cleaning up the stuff afterwards. So as you can see, I'm pouring out the Wilder oils just kind of in little spots on my paper towel here. This one here was a little bit kind of oily, as with the, uh, the brown one before. So you just kind of gently pour out the really, really thin stuff. You don't want this. This is mostly linseed oil, which will make the paint not dry very fast. And then you pour out the actual thicker stuff afterwards, which is what you want to work with. You want to work with the thicker stuff and thin it with your own thinner, not work with the thin oil paint in the tube because it won't dry then. So I grab a little bit of thinner on my brush, a little bit of oil paint, and I kind of want a very, very thin uh, mixture, as you can see, a little bit of hint of there, but not as thin as the pin wash before. This is more of a, like a tinting effect than a pin wash effect. On the engine deck here, I used both of the browns, the lighter brown, same color as the pin wash, as well as the darker brown, to create some greasy, maybe fuel stain, dust accumulation, just kind of messy effects on the engine deck. And then using more than one brown is really useful because you can make different colors there, you can mix them, you can play with them. In a couple areas I use both together as one. So here I'm grabbing a little bit more of the oil pin wash actually because you can kind of just work back and forth with the oils. And I'm applying it around that darker stain, which makes kind of like a transition for maybe drier stuff to fresher stuff there. Looks pretty cool. Adding the darker stuff here pretty heavily and it kind of just settles nicely around there acting almost like a pin wash but a little bit thicker. And over here I'm doing some kind of a fuel stain that's kind of run down so I'm using a little bit of the oil paint on my brush here and gently streaking very very carefully. I did the same thing on the sides here as well. I'm using both browns here, once again. Adds more interest if you use more than one color. I also did a similar effect up here near the transmission cover because I figured that's also a greasy, oily spot. So I grabbed a little bit there, and then I used my larger brush to kind of scrape it down and naturally make some of those kind of streaky effects. So here I'm just kind of playing around with a little bit of the thinner on my brush, which helps to kind of move the oil paint around. Once again, this is a, another effect that kind of takes a little bit of practice to get used to, just playing around with oils, but you can't really go wrong. If you mess up, you can just wipe it off with the same thinner as you're using to move it around a little bit and start again. I also kind of drag those same browns down the front here. You can see that there's different colors of brown here, like I was saying. A little more interesting than some of it looks fresh or some older, some maybe caught up with a little bit of dust so it's faded. Also trying to make your weathering symmetric, you can see that I have more streaks on the closer side than on the farther side. It's not symmetric, but it's not obviously all on one side, so it just has a little interest. Having your model a little bit imperfect, a little bit asymmetrical, makes it more interesting and almost natural looking. I figured this out of the turret here near these hatches, or the viewports I guess you call them, would also be a little bit of an interesting place for a couple of streaks, so as with everywhere else, you apply a little bit of oil paint, then you grab a little bit of thinner on your brush, you can just kind of move it around a little bit. So once again here, applying some dental streaks of oil paint, then I grab some thinner, my larger brush here, and gently rub it down. As before, 
not too much thinner on your brush. You want to have your brush like 99% no thinner, just a little hint of thinner on your brush. Gently rub at it and it should naturally kind of gently, slowly get toned down and blended in. I use the lighter color here with light buff to create some panel highlighting effects. It also could be some kind of dusty effect, I don't know. It looks kind of cool though. So in some areas, like the hatch here for example, I want to add a little bit of interest to them. So I apply a thin coat of it, and I kind of just smear it around with my brush here. This brush is actually dry right now, there's no thinner on it, I'm just moving it around. And a similar effect over here. Apply a couple of little highlights of the lighter color. Just little kind of sections of oil paint, this is almost like a dot filter but a lot more controlled and toned down. And then I just kind of scrape it around and drag it down with my brush here. And it creates some highlights and streaking effects. If you're having a little bit of trouble having the, or getting the paint to, to move a little bit, to to blend, then try a little bit of thinner on your brush. But if you don't need any thinner, don't try it. Just go with a dry brush and blend it. Once again here, highlighting another kind of elevated point here, which are these kind of angles of the viewports themselves. Here's our model with the completed oil weathering effects on it. As you can see, it's quite a transition from how it was before. Before it was just kind of a plain tank. Now you can see it suddenly looks like it's been used. It's got highlights, streaks, grimy areas. It just looks really, really cool. And you can definitely see the details are much more apparent now that we have the pin wash on there, which makes the welds and the seam lines and bolts all pop out. Also, you can see that the some of the hatches and panels like that kind of stand out more not too much, it's subtle, but that's what we are doing with that lighter oil paint color. It's almost like color modulation with the airbrush, but I'm doing it now with the paintbrush for more control. The greasy effects in the rear of the hull here also look very, very good. I was very happy with those. The engine deck definitely looks like it's been serviced recently and it looks like a well-maintained, well-used, and nice and kind of messy tank. For me, the oils are generally the last step in the overall weathering of the tank, and it's looking pretty good right now. Only a couple details left. So next up, we're going to move on to weathering the exhausts. The way I did the exhaust in this tank was something I made up on the go, so I kind of just went with it. I started off with these three colors here, which are XF72, 68, and 69, so kind of a grayish brown, rusty brown, and black. I also thinned them down a little bit with X28 here for just a brush application. And as always, guess what brush we're using? The same 10 over 0 as always. I love this brush, it's very, very good. So to start, I did an overall coat of the exhaust with the XF72, which is the grayish brown color. And I painted the entire exhaust this color, but not the actual kind of mesh covering of it. I left that with the Panzer Gray for now. I actually just painted the exhaust itself. The exhausts often got rusty, they're hot, paint gets baked off them. They're a, they're a great place to do some nice rusty effects. Tanks didn't usually rust, but the exhaust is definitely a good spot to play around with that a little bit. Along the end of the kind of hose, I guess exhaust pipe here, I kind of feathered the edge of the, uh, the rusty effects here. Now I focused in on the end of the exhaust pipe here and first applied a little bit of the XF68, which is more of a red rusty color. Applied that mainly around the edge here, but kept some of the previous brown showing through. And I took some of the black and applied that to the end to simulate the kind of soot. And I'm grabbing some more 68 here, the red rusty color, and kind of working between the two of those, the black and the rusty color. And as you can see, I'm kind of transitioning from black to rusty brown to the grayish brown along the actual length of the exhaust pipe here at the very end of it. I also took the same rusty color, the XF68, and applied it in a kind of a little bit of a stipply coat, not an entire overall coat, but I applied it to the back of the uh, the exhaust here and the overall thing. So this is kind of like a thin filtery coat, almost like what we we're doing before with the wire cutters. 
Then I applied two coats of hairspray to the exhausts here, because they need to obviously paint it with the sand camo like the rest of the tank. And then we're just doing hairspray tipping like we did before. So I just applied the hairspray, and now we're going to apply the XF59, then with X28 thinner about 60%. And I'm applying this in a thin coat. I didn't do a, like as full of coverage as before because most of this is going to be chipped off anyway, so I don't need to apply too much. Just a nice gentle overall coat. And then, as with before, hairspray chipping. Next step is obviously get a little bit of water in a brush, and then gently rub at it. And be very, very gentle because remember, I didn't, I didn't prime this. So if I go too hard, we're going to expose shiny photo etch metal, which is bad. So I'm being very, very careful. And as you can see, I'm not really as much scraping as I was before, but now I'm kind of stippling, poking at it. And I'm really focusing on the end here with the exhaust, because that's where I got that kind of transition from black to rusty brown to grayish brown. Then we use a couple oil paints. As I said before, I was making this up as I went along. So I'm using dark red and medium brown. Medium brown is the same color as I use the pin wash. I was, trying to use a, I was trying to use as few colors as I needed. So I started with the medium brown color and I thinned it a little bit in the little cup here with the, some of the wilder thinner and applied it uh, almost in the same consistency as what we're doing on the engine deck. A nice kind of thin filtery coat with a couple of kind of streaky effects on there. And I'm trying to almost get almost some of that rust from the exhaust kind of appearing up on top of the the kind of uh, mesh. So now we grab some of the reddish oil paint, do the same kind of thing. And this actually looked pretty cool. Like, like I said, I was making this up as I went along, but when I when I did, did the step here, I was like, this is kind of like almost primer chip showing through. So it's almost like it's baked off the paint with the heat. It looked pretty cool. So I'm just kind of filtering that on a very thin coat with a little bit of thinner, and it looks pretty cool. But it was a little bit too red for my opinion, so I grabbed some Wilder Light Rust Pigment, which is a nice kind of orangey color, and applied a thin coat of that over top of the oil paints we just put on there. And that got me the nice uh, orangey rust color, or rust color I wanted. As you can see, I'm applying a little bit to the end of the exhaust pipe as well. But of course, there's still some of the red oil paint showing through and some of the brown oil paint, as well as the, the colors we did before the hairspray chipping. And these exhausts, I think, look really, really good. These are the best exhausts I've ever done, I think. I'm very, very happy with them. The process I made up here, I think, is what I'm going to stick with for the future, because it came out pretty, really good. So at this point, I decided to apply a matte coat to the model to seal in all of our previous weathering effects. I'm using XF86 Flat Clear here, which is Tamiya's, I guess, matte coat. I was using X22 before, which is their clear coat. And once again, we're thinning with X28 thinner. Now this this is a, a good matte varnish product, but if you want it to be matte, you've got to apply it in thin coats. If you apply it in one overall coat, it'll come out kind of satiny. You want to apply a couple of thin coats. This is, this is always how it is. Always apply thin coats rather than one heavy coat. It's a heavy coat, you're bound to have some problems. So like I said, if you want to get matte, couple of thin coats, just mist it on, be patient, and look good in the end. Now I'm putting on the exhaust. I didn't put them on before because I was worried that the the, the satin or the, the matte varnish product was going to mess up the pigments I applied. I have bad experience with that in the past, so we just put them on afterwards. It'll be cool. And here's our exhaust on the, on the tank. They match very well with the fenders themselves right below. And the rusty colors, I think, came out very, very nice. Like I was saying, this is my new technique. I made it up and it looks pretty good, so I'm sticking with it. I think that the reds in there kind of mimic the reds in the wood, the wire cutters, and on the numbers on the side of the tank. So it all kind of goes together a little bit with the, the tones we have on the tank. So with the exhaust done, I decided to finally do the couple of details we were missing, which are the machine guns, as well as the rear light. So we're going to cover those next. These are the products we're going to use to paint the last details left on the tank. We've got a couple of paints here for the machine guns and one for the rear light. For the rear light, we're going to use just Tamiya X20, X27 Clear Red, which is very, very nice. And for the machine guns, we're going to use NATO Black, a pencil, 
and some dusty pigment. So I started with the machine guns. I just painted them straight up with this XF69 NATO Black, which is what we used previously on the exhaust for the black end. I thinned it a little bit with um, either water or X28, doesn't really matter. And I'm applying it very carefully to just the machine guns, not getting any on the turret because we've already weathered all that and looks good, so don't mess it up. Oh, and by the way, I'm using the same brush as before, 10 over 0. Then I broke the lead out of the pencil on purpose, held it in some pliers, and then I gently rubbed this over the machine guns to get a nice metallic highlight. You can also get some metallic pigments if you want, but those cost more than a free pencil at a golf course, so we're going with the pencil for now. As you can see, just gently rubbing it over there gets a nice metallic sheen. It also kind of highlights all the details, all the porting and the kind of like the ribs on the ends of the MG um, 17s here. Actually, MG 15s, I think. But they were looking a little bit too black, so I actually got a little bit of this MIG dry mud pigment, which is my favorite pigment ever, I think. The color is very, very nice. I gently brushed it over top of the machine guns to make them look a little sandy, a little used, and to make it kind of blend in with the rest of the tank. I know machine guns will be kept very, very clean, but if the tank's going around, it's going to get dusty basically instantly in North Africa. And it helped tone them down a little bit. And very briefly here, the rear light, like I said, was just painted with X27 Clear Red by Tamiya. It's a nice, kind of thin, shiny, glossy red paint, so it's good for rear lights like this. And I just basically brushed it in there with a little bit of thinner. And the rear light came out looking pretty good. And with this, our tank, at least the upper areas, are all done. As you can see, we've got all the de details painted up. It's all nicely weathered. It looks streaked. Details are popping out. It looks, it looks really, really good. I'm really happy with this tank. First time with a Desert Eyes tank, at least first series attempt, and it's looking pretty good. So all that's left, of course, is to get the lower hull effects, the sandy effects. So for the sandy effects in this tank, it was my first time doing anything like this, so I kind of just, as before, made up as I went along. I tried to keep it simple because it's my first time, so we're going to use only wild or dry European mud and the same MIG pigment as before, dry mud. We're also going to use thinner here and the same medium brown oil paint as we were using for the oil pin wash before. And for brushes, I have, guess what, the same 10 over 0. I've got a number 1 round and the same 1 8 inch angular shader as we're using for hairspray chipping. So the number 1 round and the angular shader are for the actual pigment application. Like I said, I tried to keep it simple. I first just applied kind of just an overall coat of the wilder dry European mud color. I picked this color because it, in the jar it looked like a nice kind of sandy color, but it wasn't too gray. It didn't, uh, I have a couple of pigments that are kind of more grayish looking, which go nicely with muddy colors, but this color had a little bit of a yellowish desert hint to it. So I picked it because it looked pretty good. As you can see, it, it goes on there pretty well, but it's a little bit kind of more uh, grayish and lighter, less yellow than the base color of the tank. So we're going to fix that afterwards. And like I was saying, I'm just applying an overall coat. And I really mean that. I was just kind of almost piling it on there. Because I didn't I didn't really want to do streaking effects. The, everything was already glued on. The lower hull, all, all that stuff. The tracks, the wheels. I couldn't really get in there to do much. And I didn't really want to do very much because it was my first time. So I just kept it basic and applied just an overall coat. Make it nice and dusty. And I'm just pounding it on there. The, uh, the... The matte varnish we have on there has a nice tooth to it, so it bites on the pigments very, very well and holds them on. So we don't need to fix them. It, we just put them on and they'll stick pretty well. And now I'm using the other pigment, which is the MIG Dry Mud Pigment, which is, like I was saying, my favorite color because it looks really, really good. It's very similar to the, pr the previous pigment we were using, the Wilder one, but has a little bit more of a yellowy, orangey tint to it, which you can kind of see there. So it mimics um, the color, the base color of the tank. And I'm applying this to kind of transition between the RAL 8000 base color. Now we have this MIG pigment here, which kind of has a nice uh, yellowy, sandy color. And then we transition down to the drier, dustier color we already put on there from Wilder. 
And also, using more than one pigment makes the tank look a little better. Like, the same thing before, we're using more than one brown for the oil effects on the rear. Adds a little bit more interest, makes it look like there's kind of just more kind of naturally occurring variation in there. So that's what we're doing here. I'm just kind of, as you can see, I'm just, I'm just applying it in mess. I got a little bit of my brush and I'm just kind of throwing it on. Now I'm grabbing some wilder thinner on my brush and I'm reactivating the oil pin wash we are using before. This is what I meant when I was showing the brown oil paint previously. We're just going to reactivate our oil pin wash because it's kind of dry in the bottom there. And we're going to apply it to certain areas to get some kind of greasy effects going in the wheels. If you look at uh, restored tanks that run to this day, they get greasy pretty quick as they run along. So a little bit of grease is interesting and it kind of helps to break up the just the sandy effects we have on here. And as I was saying before, when I was doing the greasy effects in the front of the hull, keep it random, keep it not uniform. So on this side, I applied it to the idler mount here. You saw me previously putting on the front wheel and then the, the second wheel station. On this side, I also put on the second wheel station, but in a slightly different location and blended some pigments over top to tone it down. And we also applied it to the drive sprocket here to get some kind of greasy effects going. So like I said, I applied it in different spots on either side to add interest to make the tank look like it's just kind of random and greasy in various locations. And here's our sandy effects in the tank. I think it came out very, very good. I kept it basic, kept it simple. Just kind of dusted it up, made it look like it's been going around the desert, but not nothing too heavy on there. It, it's not like mud. You can't really get too much of a texture with sand. It's just kind of a, a thin, dusty coat. That's what I think sand weathering should look like. I also popped on the clear light here at the end and dusted up a little bit. And with that, our tank is complete. Here is my completed Panzer 1 Aus A, I guess, DAC version. I am very happy with how this came out. I think it was a great learning experience. Considering I kind of made up how I did the rusty effects and made up how I did the dusty effects on the fly. And um, I'm entirely happy with it. There's nothing on this tank that I really don't like. But uh, in the future, when I do sandy effects, I'll go further, make some streaking effects on there, and probably also add some more stowage, because desert tanks, German desert tanks, often had a lot of stowage on there, which is pretty cool looking. But as you can see, many, many weather effects on there, but not as many products as you use. Or try to keep it similar using similar oil paints, similar colors overall. That helps to keep it simple, keep the cost down, and also make everything kind of look like it goes together because they're, they're similar colors. I think that the hairspray chipping was a really, really good idea to get that nice, heavily chipped desert color on there. You can see it looks like the tank's been used. The guys have been walking around servicing it. The exhausts, I think, look beautiful. The greasy effects and the dust on the on the lower areas of the tank also look like they look really, really good, I think. Engine deck, nice and greasy, but again, pretty simple. Just a couple oil paints on there, just two colors. Applying them in thin layers, gentle streaking. And also you can see gentle highlighting on the actual commander's hatch there. Machine guns, basic effects there, black, metal highlight, dusty color. On the front here, the oil streaks definitely kind of blend in with the sand and the oil streaks in the rear of the turret here help to emphasize the details there and blend in the decals. I honestly hope that this video was helpful for you guys. If you're doing a desert tank, I hope you're inspired or have some ideas for techniques you can try. This was a very fun experience. Very fun techniques on there. This is all fun. Nothing messed up, so that's always a good, <laughs> a good part of the whole thing. Um, if you have any questions or comments about anything or anything not even in this video, just anything, Post them below. I'll try to answer them. I always read through them all. Other people are always in there answering them. It's a great community we have on YouTube. Everybody's helping each other out. But like I said, any questions or comments, post them in there. I'll do my best to answer them. And if they're really, really good, I will do a video tutorial focusing on just that technique. I've done that before. It's really, really cool. And I like interacting with you guys a lot. As always, a couple of huge thanks at the end of the video. First of all, thanks to Luke Steele, who has provided some of the music in this video. And thanks to Adam Mann for recommending the Tamiya color I used for the Desert REL 8000. It's a very, very good color, XF59. And also, huge thanks to the Patreons who give me a little bit of money every month, which helps me making these videos for you guys. They are Gary Wayne Bradford, Stephen Eldridge, Philip Kruger, Stanislaw Koinitz, Harry Ainsworth, Chris Kors, Ian Shustrick, Johnny Foxtrot, Richard Ward, John Butler, Sam Murphy, Ji Hanju, Barry Olage, and Jun Yi, as well as Dr. Eo, who supports me similarly through PayPal. You guys are all very, very awesome. It's much appreciated that you support me. It means a lot to me. So like I said, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. 
and questions or comments, post them below. Don't be afraid to ask. Questions or comments are great. Not sure when I will have the next one up, not sure what it will be on. Might be hand applied camouflages, like winter camouflages. Might be Panzer Grey. Um, maybe something modern. Uh, but definitely a tiger. A tiger will be sometime soon. Full hour long video on any of those things. Uh, I'll get them up as soon as I can. But yes, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye and happy modeling.